committee will come to order. I would like to thank everybody for being here today as we tackle this important subject. I would like to begin this hearing by stating uh, the Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know that what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with watchdog, citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the, committee, to the American people and to bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Again, I want to thank everybody for being here and our, our witnesses today for the, today's hearing, uh, TSA Oversight Part 1, Whole Body Imaging. This is the first in a series of uh, hearings that we will have uh, relating to the TSA. Um, in essence, one of my fundamental concerns is the need to secure our airports. We have a true threat in the United States of America. But at the same time, we also need to, uh, to uphold our freedoms and our liberties, our civil liberties. And oftentimes, I think there is a false choice that is given that we need to give up our personal privacy in the name of security. And that is in part what we are going to talk about today. I would like to rank, uh, welcome the Ranking Member Tierney and members of the subcommittee and those of you watching our live webcast at oversight.house.gov. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, we will seek testimony from private sector and government witnesses on the United States security programs and policies and their relationship to the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution. The United States continues to face real and serious threats from Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups. Since 9-11, terrorists have exploited American airport security checkpoints and, by all accounts, will continue to try to do so. On December 22, 2001, a terrorist boarded a flight from Paris to Miami, where in flight he attempted to detonate explosives packed in his shoes. If not for the heroic efforts of passengers, flight attendants and a malfunctioning device, he may very well have succeeded. In 2006, British, in British intelligence and foiled a plot to detonate liquid explosives aboard 10 different transatlantic flights, plots that would have undoubtedly caused a tremendous loss of life and terror. On December 25, 2009, another terrorist, also known as the Christmas Day bomber, attempted to blow up a Northwest flight over Detroit. Again, passengers aboard the flight, along with, the, with a faulty device, thwarted another tragedy. On October 29, 2010, al Qaeda oper operatives packed a printer cartridge full of explosives and shipped in the United States aboard a U UPS airplane. Good intelligence, not effective screening, saved the day. In each of these instances, brave passengers, effective intelligence, and a little bit of luck averted mass tragedies. But this is not good enough. The Federal Government has reacted to each of these events with programmatic reforms and recommendations, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security being the most notable. These actions opened new lines of communication between agencies and redirected American efforts to protect the flying public. The American public is familiar with many of these reforms enacted at our nation's airports. These changes are what bring us here today. Over the past 10 years, Americans have sacrificed freedom and convenience for greater airport security. We remove shoes, surrender our sunscreens, submit to full body scans and enhance pat-downs. The committee has an obligation to ask whether these policies actually truly enhance security. We have an obligation to ask tough questions and, when needed, find solutions. We must assess whether Federal screening procedures can be done with greater efficiency and greater effectiveness. We must examine whether Federal Government has a common sense layered and threat based approach to airport security and is it truly securing the American public. We must also determine whether the Department of Homeland Security is maximizing available resources, alternative strategies and innovative techniques. We need to look into behavior detection intelligence gathering and analysis, explosive trace de detection, look into vapor wake dogs and how they could be effective in airports. These are some of the other security-based techniques that should be included in the discussion. What separates the United States of America from the rest of the world is our ability as a people to ask tough questions of those in the public policy arena. We will examine effectiveness and health risks associated with whole body imaging devices. We will hear from privacy experts and average Americans about the naked images that are secured in those whole body imaging machines and talked about candidly about the enhanced pat downs that are now being implemented. We will ask tough questions about alternative screening methods and their role in the debate. We will examine the evidence and look at what has been said by the TSA and compare it to what is actually being done. In short, I am proud of the United States of America and I 
the ability to have this type of uh, interaction in an open and transparent way. I appreciate everybody that is here and joining us in this discussion. And at this time, I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Tierney for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all the witnesses for being present here today. Um, past incidents have demonstrated that Al Qaeda and its affiliates are looking for ever more creative ways to attack the United States commercial airline industry and our traveling public. As a nation, I think it falls on us to determine what human, economic, and psychological costs of a terrorist attack on a commercial airline warrant extraordinary defense measures and how costly, intrusive, and inconvenient we are willing to have those measures be. None of us like to take off our shoes or throw away our water bottles or empty our pockets of change simply in order to board a plane. But most would be willing to take this sacrifice if there is a reasonable certainty that such actions would help prevent other terrorist attacks. Following the Christmas Day bomber attack in 2009, with funding and some encouragement from some in Congress, TSA procured and deployed body scanning machines on a national scale. According to the TSA Administrator and two TSA witnesses that were scheduled to be here today, these scanners represent the best available method to detect metallic and nonmetallic threat items concealed on a passenger such as the Christmas Day bomber. We should be willing to explore whether or not that is, in fact, the case. We must also weigh this technology against Americans' legitimate privacy interest. By now, we have all seen copies of body scan images that show much more than any of us would like to publicly reveal. Has the TSA taken significant enough steps to address these concerns? I understand that there is also additional technology available and in testing as we speak that would likely obviate these concerns altogether. If this is the case, I would encourage TSA to expedite the testing of that technology and deploy it as rapidly as possible if it is effective in identifying uh, anomalies. It is worth noting that according to a CBS poll conducted in November of 2010, an overwhelming majority of Americans, 81 percent, approve of the use of whole body scanning devices at U.S. airports. That fact doesn't take away from legitimate privacy concerns that we all share, but it is a helpful data point about how much sacrifice most Americans are willing to make to prevent terrorist strikes from happening again. One of our witnesses, Dr. Brenner, has also raised serious concerns about the potential health risks associated with wide-scale employment of body scanners. I look forward to discussing with Dr. Brenner his analysis. But it seemingly is at odds with studies conducted by the National Academy of Sciences, the Food and Drug Administration, the American College of Radiology, and the British Health Protection Agency. TSA has a difficult and unenviable task. At one moment, they are criticized for not doing enough to detect and stop potential threats. On another moment, they are criticized for doing too much or not doing it in a proper way. Our role is to provide constructive oversight that can help TSA strike the right balance of security, privacy, cost, and convenience. I encourage my colleagues and our witnesses here today to provide solutions rather than just heap on criticism. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Yes. Mr. 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 Chairman, I, I came today uh, with the intent of questioning witnesses from the second panel from the Transportation Security Administration about the subject. And I appreciate, first of all, you and uh, the ranking member conducting this hearing. I have since been informed, and I'm, I appreciate our first panel of witnesses, but I have since been informed that uh, uh, we will not have representatives today of the T Transportation Security Administration. Uh, I would like to request of the Chair, and maybe in consultation with the Ranking Member, how we can um, uh, proceed in the future to have, uh, and I understand they have submitted some written testimony, but for the purpose of appearing before this subcommittee, answering appropriate uh, questions, and some of them will evolve from what's, uh, what the, the testimony that will be presented here today. But in-person representatives of the TSA, either by subpoena uh, or by, uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, if you would consult with the council on both sides of the aisle, uh, how we can uh, demand uh, and ensure their appearance before the committee in the future. Uh, that is the nature of my parliamentary inquiry or my inquiry at this time. But I think it is very important that this subcommittee uh, hear from those individuals who are involved with, again, uh, the question uh, before us today, and this is the TSA Oversight Part 1 on whole body imaging. So for the future, uh, either by subpoena or uh, requiring their attendance before this subcommittee. 
I, I appreciate uh, the, the gentleman is correct that uh, despite uh, early assurances, uh, confirmation of their attendance and participation in this hearing by two members of the TSA, uh, senior members of, of their uh, administration, that they would attend. Uh, we were given notice late last night, uh, something that I physically was able to see yesterday, that it was their intention now not to attend. Um, I find that to be an embarrassment to the agency. I think it is highly inappropriate. And I assure you that the TSA will appear before this committee. They should appear today. I will give them the benefit of the doubt until we begin to swear in the second panel. But at that time, uh, should they choose not to attend at their own choice, after confirming that they would attend, having people fly in from around the country as far as away as Alaska and others, I, I think it is inexcusable and embarrassing that it is now their intention not to show up. The gentleman yield. Yes. The gentleman is well aware. Uh, he said he got a letter yesterday, letters dated March 14, 2011. And the TSA had no problem with testifying before this committee. As a matter of fact, they wanted to testify before the committee. The problem is, is that the majority insisted that they be seated alongside non-governmental witnesses who represent the Electronic Privacy Information Center. And that organization is actually engaged in multiple lawsuits against the TSA. Now, it just they, are, they, they have assured us and have assured you that they are willing to testify. They want to testify. But to sit at the same table where people are suing you um, is just probably not appropriate. So um, I think with some flexibility, uh, you could have them in here at any moment. And I think that we need to be very careful. And I think Mr. Issa has been uh, most uh, cooperative with regard to dealing with subpoenas. If subpoenas are necessary, that is one thing. But when you have got somebody suing you and you are sitting at the same table as a lawyer, I can tell you that complicates matters quite a bit down the road. So I think there is a way to resolve this. Uh, the majority, uh, minority will cooperate in working with uh, the majority to, to, to accomplish this. We all want them to appear. They want to appear. They have a great story to tell. And so uh, I yield back. Uh, thank you. In, in response to the gentleman, if I may, uh, if they wanted to appear, they could, they should, and they would. The problem is that they have elected not to appear. As the gentleman knows, members on the panel take questions from members of Congress. They don't take questions from the person seated next to them. In order to give members the proper opportunity to question both those that are criticizing the TSA and then allow for a timely response from the TSA, I think is most productive for this committee. And therefore, uh, I had elected to seat them on the same panel. Just two weeks ago, we had the State Department, we had the uh, Department of Defense, we had the, inspector, uh, the Special Inspector General all seated together on the same panel. Both complained. Oh, they wanted special treatment. They wanted to go first. They didn't want to have to wait. They didn't want to have to but we talked to them, explained the situation, and as was complimented, I hope this is a fair characterization, a compliment from the ranking member saying that was a swift and efficient hearing, it was a productive use of the member's time, and we got through that hearing without incident. I think that is a good precedent. It happened two weeks ago from people that were, had contradictory points of view, and it is the way we will conduct this subcommittee. General Neal. Yes, Thank happy you. to yield. Uh, that is a reasonable characterization uh, of what I would have said. I don't recall saying it, but I certainly would have said that uh, and indicated to you that I thought the hearing went well. Uh, and I, I think we have had this tussle in the past. When I was Chair, we would go back and forth with both administrations, the Bush administration and uh, uh, the subsequent administration, the Obama administration, about their wanting to be first, they want to be a separate panel and all that. And I really believe strongly in the prerogatives of the House. It is our hearing, we control it, and we go. I think what is unique about this and where I separate from you on that is the litigation issue. And I think Mr. Cummings is right. When you are uh, when you're advising a client, not only do you not want them to be on the same panel with people that are suing you, you don't want the optics of having to say, I am not going to answer that question or that is an inappropriate question given these circumstances. I don't think that is fair to put people in that position. 
Uh, I think in this case, with this litigation, putting them on the panel with the other litigant probably is a step too far, and I think we can reach an accommodation on making sure the progress of the House are retained uh, in getting witnesses to take what panels we want them on and what order we want them on, but making an exception in a matter of litigation uh, and giving them a separate opportunity. And if that were the case here today, I think they would have come, they would have testified, we would have gotten the information we want, and it would have been better. So I just ask that perhaps in the future you consider that. Uh, aspect of it, and we try to find a way to cooperatively move forward on that and, and give the agency a chance to say its case as well. Yield back. With the du Chairman, duly, yield. No duly noted. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll, and I will be brief, as the others have been. Uh, this committee has a long history of doing it right and doing it wrong. Under two chairmen ago, the Fallujah Four litigation subjects were brought in here and uh, Quite frankly, they were brought in to promote a lawsuit uh, that the Chairman was very well aware of. Uh, the Pat Tillman case, the same thing happened. It is not our intention, as the Chairman knows and as I know he worked hard, to facilitate any confrontation about a litigation. This will not happen on, on my watch or the Chairman's watch. What we will do is we will insist on our right to seat people on a panel we believe is appropriate. We make exceptions current members of the House and Senate, current full Cabinet officers, and certainly any persons from directly from the executive branch would be seated separately out of deference to their current uh, status. We will continue to work with the ranking member, and Mr. Cummings has been very reasonable in supporting us when he thought we were right and asking for changes when he thought we were wrong. The gentlelady from Alaska has come a long way. I, I want to hear what she has to say. I would have happily had TSA sitting next to her. My understanding is there is no lawsuit, but there certainly is a legitimate claim that TSA is not living up to the promises they made for how these scanners would be used and how they would do their job. So I look forward to that. I will work with the ranking member. I would note that although every member has the uh, the testimony from TSA will not be placed in the record since they did not appear. There will not be any unanimous consent to place it in the record. You will all have the opportunity to read it, and we will look forward to that testimony and appropriate rebuttal when the TSA comes. Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing. Certainly with 57,000 and counting TSA employees, uh, countless people, including the gentlelady from Alaska who comes from a city in which you can only leave the city in the winter, I guess, by dog sled, but most of the year by ship or by aircraft, it is essential that those air travelers have an opportunity to efficiently, effectively, and privately be able to uh, go through screening and get, on, uh, get onto the aircraft that bring them to the rest of Alaska and the lower 48. So, Mr. Chairman, this is important. As we all heard here today, this is a very bipartisan issue that we get right what we, after nearly a decade, have not gotten right. And I thank you for your attention, your continued attention. And as this title says, this is number one. We will be back here as long as it takes in our oversight role to get it right. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I, 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 um, at this time, I would like to ask unanimous consent that Sheila Jackson Lee and Rush Holt be allowed to participate in this hearing and ask questions of the witnesses. Without objection. So ordered. Uh, the Chair will entertain any additional opening statements that members would like to make. Does any other member wish to make an opening statement? Mr. Cummings, gentlemen is recognized, Ranking Member of the Full Committee. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for uh, the discussion that we just had, and uh, to you and to our Ranking Member, Mr. Tierney. Uh, on the substance of today's hearing, we all share the same goal. And let me emphasize that. We share the same goal, keeping airline passengers safe and secure with as little inconvenience or invasion of privacy as possible. The whole body imaging technology we are examining was introduced following a terrorist attempt to blow up a Northwest Airlines flight in December 2009 using nonmetallic explosives. I let that sink in. In response to the threat posed by the so-called Christmas Day bomber and others, TSA introduced a number of new security measures, including whole body imaging. By the way, Congress fully supported this effort 
by funding the procurement of hundreds of these machines. Because the TSA witnesses are not here to speak for themselves, let me read from their written testimony, which I, will, which, which I hope that we will hear. And it says that, based upon our analysis of the latest intelligence and after studying available technologies and other processes, TSA has concluded that advanced imaging technology is an effective method to detect threat items concealed on passengers while maintaining efficient checkpoint screening operations. TSA continually evaluates these technologies, their software and associated screening procedures to ensure that they are effective against established and anticipated threats while continuing to protect passenger privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. Now, you know, I think it was our ranking member of the subcommittee who said, uh, he didn't say it like I'm about to say it, but he said it, the TSA is damned that they do is damned that they don't. If you have a, uh, an incident, particularly coming after the Christmas Day bomber incident, and if they did not try to address that issue in the most effective and efficient way and the most non-evasive way as possible, then and somebody was harmed and, God forbid, killed, then people would be screaming at them. So as we conduct our oversight, it is important to understand that the TSA professionals charged with protecting the traveling public have determined that this technology is necessary to detect the very real threats posed by Al Qaeda and their affiliates. Our role in this effort should be to provide constructive oversight to help TSA strike the right balance between the need for security and concerns about convenience, cost, health, and privacy. And I want to make it clear, as our ranking member has, every member on this side of the aisle, and I am sure on the other side of the aisle, our number one concern is the safety of our traveling public and at the same time striking a balance so that we have procedures that protect them but do not go too far uh, with regard to invading their privacy uh, and making sure that they uh, can have a, 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 a wonderful traveling experience. And we understand, and I want to thank our witness for being here today. I am sorry that you have gone through what you have gone through. But again, we need to strike this balance and get it right. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, I, will, I look forward to working <clears throat> with you, Mr. Chairman, and our ranking member to make sure that we get TSA here so that they can testify appropriately. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would like to ask unanimous consent that the statement of Robin Kane, who is the Assistant Administrator for Operational Process and Technology and Lee Care, is the Assistant Administrator for Security Operations, Transportation Security Administration, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, be admitted for the record. Reserving the right to object. Like, do you like the record? Yes. Well, uh, I don't have the uh, chair here now, but uh, uh, I do think that um, since they have chosen not to appear today that I would prefer that when they appear that we submit that uh, to the record. And uh, we would also at that time have the opportunity to, to, uh, to examine and question those uh, witnesses based on the uh, submission of their testimony. So uh, I, I will continue uh, to object to the submission of their testimony at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yes, I, I, I too would reserve. Uh, the intention is for that to, that to be placed in at a time in which the witnesses can be made available, and uh, I look forward to that opportunity and yield back. Mr. Chairman, if I may speak to the objection. Yes. Uh, I think that we all understand that we want the TSA people to come back and testify. That is that's a given, and I don't think anybody objects to the notion that they will be back and, and testify. I think with sort of unique circumstances that they ended up not being here today. They did circulate their testimony last night by email to all the members. I think it is helpful for us in questioning here today, if we are going to ask a question, to be able to refer to something that is on the record and keep the record intact. In I think it is helpful also for people that might look back at this hearing to have a full um, account of all of the different positions that, that might be available here and still reserve the right to bring them back. But I do note that it wasn't a fact that they wouldn't testify. It was a fact that they had circumstances uh, with confronting litigants on the same panel that we may or may not disagree on or whatever. But I think it is extraordinary in this case. And I think for the uh, for the panel itself and for the um, 
for this hearing, it would be appropriate to have those materials on the record? Uh, the Chair would uh, disagree somewhat with the characterization of that, but fair enough. There has been an objection to the unanimous consent request, therefore it is denied. Um, as there is an objection, we do not have unanimous consent. The statements will not be entered into the Mr. record. Mr. Chairman? We yes. Then I would move that uh, we enter those statements on the record and ask for a vote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. Uh, is a vote in order during a hearing? I don't believe it is. I don't believe it is. Um, we have not yet become, got to the second uh, panel. We have not yet confirmed whether or not they are going to indeed show up. There was a unanimous uh, consent request. There was an objection that has been denied. Consequently, the Chair is now going to recognize, we are still in the opening statement mode, uh, the Chair is now going to recognize the gentleman from Florida, the Chairman of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Micah of Florida. Thank you. And I am here in the capacity as a member, uh, 18 years standing of the uh, Government Reform and Oversight Committee. And uh, again, I thank uh, both the Ranking Member and the Chair for conducting this, uh, this oversight hearing. And this is a very important uh, responsibility, I think, of this committee. Um, transportation security, and, you know, I, I uh, started some of this um, as chair of the Aviation Subcommittee. You never know what the good Lord has in store for us, but I was made the chair in 2001, somewhat later than uh, usual, uh, the appointment of chairs, but uh, then we were confronted with uh, the attacks of September 11th and had to put in place a security system for transportation for our country. It's probably one of the most important things we can do, uh, particularly for aviation. We have seen that uh, the threats still exist. Uh, I think that uh, these folks uh, have seen the damage they can do to our economy, to our society, to our way of life, and they, uh, they uh, are still determined to come after us. Uh, and uh, I think, therefore, it is very important that we have in place systems that work. Um, I helped initiate a number of the, uh, uh, the programs, in fact, asked them to look at advanced imaging technology, and I am supportive of using advanced uh, technology for uh, determining threats and risks. Uh, my concern is the well, first, the manner in which the, uh, and I don't have the opportunity to question the TSA uh, representatives, the manner in which these uh, pieces of very expensive equipment were uh, acquired. And I would hope that the committee and committee staff, if they are listening, uh, would, uh, would in fact uh, review very carefully the acquisition. This is somewhere in the neighborhood of half a billion dollars. Furthermore, I am very concerned about the testing. In the past, when uh, we worked, and I see Mr. Cummings there, uh, we were always consulted by TSA in the acqu major acquisition and deployment of uh, new screening technologies. I don't think that that was adequately done in this purchase. Uh, I'm concerned about the testing results, and every member of this panel should have the class a classified briefing. I had the equipment tested by GAO uh, in uh, in December of this past year, and then I had the pat-downs tested in January. Everyone sh uh, should be required, every member of Congress, to see the um, ex extensive failure rate. I can't uh, disclose it, uh, but um, it, it, it really concerns me when you spend a half a billion uh, dollars and then another half a billion dollars for additional personnel and it, it, it uh, doesn't work uh, uh, as it should. Uh, even the initial deployment of portals is a joke. Um, even uh, a, a, um, a seventh grader, I think, could come up with a better plan for deploying and utilizing this equipment. And it doesn't have to be used for e everyone like uh, uh, we have seen it uh, deployed. Uh, I, and then again, I have great concern about uh, the failure of its use and even uh, the implications of its use. Uh, people in this country are protected by the Fourth Am Amendment. Uh, they shouldn't be subject to search, uh, illegal search and uh, seizure, 
seizure and uh, embarrassment uh, uh, and assumed uh, uh, guilty. Uh, we can and we must do better, especially uh, for uh, aviation security, and I am disappointed. Uh, there, there are more fundamental problems with TSA, and I asked the members of the panel to work with me. Uh, for a period we did not a long period, we did not have an administrator. We have had five administrators in five years. The, this administration chose not to appoint someone. Well, actually, I think they named several who uh, were cast aside, but uh, the first appointment didn't come until about uh, eight or nine months into the President's term. That needs, needs to be changed. Um, the, there are more than 200 uh, personnel in TSA making more than the administrator. Uh, the administrator now has an army of 3,770 personnel in Washington, D.C., making an average of $105,000 a person. I was taken aside the other day by someone who just left TSA. He said he worked in a de department where ten, 10 secretaries made more than $100,000. This is, a, this is an agency crying out for reform, and I think it is very sad that they, they would choose not to show up today. I hope that we can get them. Uh, I know we will get them at a future, um, uh, at a future hearing, and I will be glad to uh, participate in uh, questioning them at that time. I thank you again for convening this hearing and yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Iowa for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The challenges facing the TSA are not a Democratic problem or a Republican problem. They are a problem that faces every American who travels. And those of us who travel frequently know that this is one of those difficult balancing acts that we face in a country that treasures its privacy, treasures its liberty, but also wants to protect its citizens. And that is the challenge we face in this subcommittee today. With each successive terrorist attempt against our airports and airplanes, the TSA has responded with new and usually more inconvenient technology to address the threat, from removing our shoes at the X-ray machines to limiting liquids and gels to advanced imaging technologies that are able to screen whole bodies for suspect material. I don't deny there is a clear need for security, as the attempts by would-be terrorists Richard Reed and Umar Farooq Abdul-Matalib show, but I have serious concerns over protecting the rights of our citizens and ensuring that the technology we use are fully effective and safe. Recent studies suggest that the whole body imaging technology currently in use may be ineffective at detecting concealed explosives, such as those used in the Christmas Day bombing attempt in 2009, as well as suggesting that the backscatter X-ray technology in these AIT devices could be a higher risk to health than indicated. I believe that we should work together to find more effective screening mechanisms through the greater deployment and use of explosive trace detection technology that could better detect explosives and preserve the modesty and personal rights of American citizens. That is why I was proud to introduce the Protect the Lives of Americans Now Through Enhanced Screening, or the Planes Act, last Congress. This legislation calls for more intelligent use of screening technology to ensure safety at airports. I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses today, and I hope that this hearing sheds light on why technology has to be the best answer to terrorist threats from the TSA and how we work together to protect the rights and health of our own citizens, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Arizona for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding this important hearing on the Transportation Securities Administration use of the whole body image imaging at the airport and security. The series of hearings starting today to analyze TSA's efforts to increase airport security since the Christmas Day bomber incident is the type of hearing this committee should hold to ensure the government is working on the best interests of our constituents. In light of the thousands of constituent concerns and alarming press accounts we have heard, it is critical this committee revisit air, airport security policy. TSA must develop effective policies and processes that keep the traveling public safe and maintain our nation's security while keeping in mind passenger safety. Air transportation is one of our nation's most essential infrastructures, and the policies and activities of the Transportation Security Administration have a direct impact on more of our constituents than almost any other Federal agency. 
In my home state of Arizona, Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport is a primary airport, one of the 10 busiest in the nation and among the top 20 busiest in the world. Sky Harbor Airport has a $90 million daily economic impact. Last year, they saw 38,554,530 passengers come through the airport and 276,338 tons of cargo coming in and out, and over 440,000 aircraft passing through. With a heavy volume of passenger, cargo, and aircraft, Phoenix Car Airport was one of the first test sites for the whole body imaging scanners in 2007. Today, there are nearly 500 imaging technology units at 78 airports. The implementation of the whole body imaging scanners in Phoenix Sky Airport has not been without controversy. There have been numerous press accounts documenting passengers, and these new scanners and I have heard concerns from many of my constituents directly. There have been various local press reports mentioning that passengers are concerned with the lack of privacy and who may be viewing these images. I think we can all agree that we need to effectively protect air passengers while at the same time respectively passengers right. As a medical professional practicing for over 25 years, I am also concerned about the potential health risks posed by the machines. TSE reports on radiation exposure have been challenged by a variety of independent studies. I look forward to hearing the witnesses' testimony on the scientific data, as it is critical that the health of our constituents are carefully considered when analyzing TSA's security efforts. It is important to note that the whole body imaging technology is not cheap. It is estimated the total cost for this program will be about $50 million for 2013. In a time when everyone is forced to cut back, I think it is only fair to ensure that if the Federal Government is going to spend the money on this initiative, it better be very effective. And finally, we must ensure that we have a consistent, fair and uniform policy across the board. No one airport should operate any differently when it comes to security or how to handle passengers. My constituents are telling me that simply is not the case. The Federal Government must strike the proper balances between security and privacy. I would like to thank the witnesses for appearing before the Committee today and contributing to the Committee's work to reexamine TSA's travel security policies. I look forward to hearing your testimonies and, and discussing what it is and isn't working regarding airport security. Thank you. I yield back. General Neal's back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the uh, members of the panel for appearing before the Committee when they eventually do appear. Uh, uh, just, just a point on that. It has, as, as former chair, subcommittee chair, it has been the practice uh, that we have uh, taken agencies uh, uh, singly to, to allow them to avoid, uh, uh, you know, conflict with, uh, with other parties and uh, also just to give them a basic uh, courtesy. So, but but I, I respect the, the chair's decision on how to handle that. Uh, it, it is not, not necessarily how it has been handled in the past. Uh, to the substance of today's committee's hearing, uh, I, I do want to amplify the concern about health risks, and uh, not, not only for the traveling public, but also <clears throat> we have uh, TSA workers, uh, TSOs as they are called, uh, Transit Security, Transportation Security Officers, who may indeed screen anywhere from from 200 to 400 or 500 people in a shift. Uh, we have some very, very busy airports uh, uh, that uh, handle huge volumes of people. And uh, so one of the areas of interest that I have is, is on their behalf, on behalf of our TSOs, to make sure that uh, this repetitive uh, exposure, even though it is uh, alleged to be low-level exposure, uh, to, to the radiation, the low-level radiation given off by these scanners, uh, I'm concerned about their, their safety. And uh, I've heard from a couple of the uh, employer groups, I guess that's not their official union yet, but uh, the NTEU and also uh, the American Federation of Government Employees, who have asked uh, that some of these workers, just to allay their fears, be allowed to wear a dosimeter, which is uh, uh, you know, a, a device which will record uh, the levels of exposure uh, to radiation which the wearer uh, encounters. And I think that is a, that's a reasonable 
approach. However, it has not been embraced by TSA. And uh, that resistance is, is similar to the resistance that we had a couple of years ago when we had the, uh, the uh, swine flu e epidemic, no, no, I'm a H1N1 uh, epidemic, uh, which emanated in, in, in Mexico City, it started there, and yet we would not allow our TSOs uh, in Brownsville and, and a number of the airports along the Mexican border, we would not allow them to wear masks. We would not allow them to use Purell on their hands uh, in between the uh, screenings and pat-downs of, of people coming across the border. Uh, so we allowed those officers to be exposed to a hazard that I think they should not have been exposed to. And uh, when I say we would not allow, I, say, I mean the Department of Homeland Security and, and the TSA uh, uh, leadership would not allow those workers to protect themselves. And yet those workers are going home every day to their families, and so you see the, the lunacy in, in that policy. And so that experience does not encourage me, uh, does not, uh, you know, uh, lead me to believe that, uh, that responsibility is being taken by TSA. The other issue is the, uh, is the privacy issue. And uh, this, is a, this is a serious issue, and there's got to be a way that, uh, that we can protect the public uh, during these, uh, these imaging screenings. And uh, I think the, the, the most profound uh, deterrent to recklessness with respect to the screening process and the images that can be stored on these systems is to provide a cause of action for the public. If TSA knows that they can be sued and serious damage can result to them as a result of their lapse uh, handling of privacy issues, then they will be diligent about protecting the public's privacy. If they can do it, if they can mishandle uh, private information like that and these images, then and there's no consequences, then they, they will do exactly that. Uh, experience and reason agree on that point. So uh, on those points, health risks and privacy issues, I hope that uh, we'll get some helpful uh, direction and instruction from our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Would any other members like to wish to make an opening statement? Members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now recognize our first panel. We are honored to have uh, Sharon Cisna, who is a member of the Alaska State Legislature. She represents the, second, the 22nd district there in Alaska. She is a Democrat, and I appreciate the, the length and the short notice that she has taken uh, to travel a great distance to be here uh, today. So we thank you for your presence. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify. You please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. We will now recognize you for five minutes. Press the, there you go. Thank you. Uh, great. Um, and uh, Chairman uh, Javits and, um, uh, and Ranking Member uh, Tierney, uh, I, uh, and, and also uh, fellow members of the uh, subcommittee. Um, I wanted to, first of all, introduce myself, and my name is Sharon Cisna, and yes, I am a State Representative, State House, um, and have been with the Legislature now uh, seven terms, I am in my seventh, and represent District 22, which is, in fact, the, um, the district in the State uh, that has the universities and medical systems that actually serve the whole State. So my focus really is health and, uh, and education. Those are the two, health, two focus I have. I have another thing uh, that actually brings me here, and that is that I fit a profile of the people that are harmed by the present 
uh, the the TSA, and that's a that's a initials that I haven't actually used very often before, but suddenly found myself actually starting in November of this last year in a situation where, like so many other Alaskans, I went down for a second opinion to Seattle and got that, that um, medical procedure done, went out to the airport not having a clue that there had been any changes in the screening devices. And SeaTac had just put, the, put it in. This was in early November. And because, in fact, I am what I like to consider a veteran of breast cancer, I fit that profile that instantly is going to have the, the full, very invasive hand search. And this is not something that I have talked to many people about, but I am going to talk to you now about it, because I think it is really important. And I think this actually, as I have listened to your conversation, brings something that we really don't oftentimes look at when we are talking about um, the, the total world of, of our, our country. We don't often, we look at the economy, we look at the statistics, we look at that kind of thing, but oftentimes we don't look at the individual lives of the people that we are serving and what actually is affecting them and how. It is oftentimes in the research that we see, and we see this especially in Alaska, because we don't have enough numbers to really make it work, and that is the, the research that shows what kind of harm is really being done when. If you have got very few numbers, it doesn't fit into research, and yet people are being harmed. In my case, it was because as a teenager, I experienced bad touch and have spent my adult life working on making sure that assault doesn't happen to, to the kids that I have come in contact with, which in having worked in the mental health field uh, for a number of years, starting in actually 1962, um, which of course shows that I am not new at all of this. Um, really has been something that is a lot larger than we ever talk about or think about or even test. I am fairly sure of that. So when, in fa fact, I went through the screening device, I was in front of the woman who tried to tell me that I simultaneously was going to go through the new uh, hand pat, hand pat, I consider it feeling up, and I am sorry, but I am going to refer to it that way. Um, please accept that. I, I went through this, and that is the way I feel about it. She was also telling me, very rudely as a matter of fact, that I had to simultaneous to whatever she was going to do to me, and she wasn't really explaining that because I think she was trying to remember. She had just been trained. She was learning. It showed. Uh, but uh, simultaneously, I was supposed to be watching my baggage, and at that point, I look over at my baggage, and other people's bags are now piling on top of mine, and someone is going through my bag, trying to figure out, I'm sure, that it, if it was theirs, I, I start moving towards it, and she yanks me back and, and very rudely tells me, stand still, keep your eye on your bags yet I am supposed to now sit, stand and put my hands in certain ways to have her feeling me up. And it was very intensive. All right. That happened. For several weeks after that, and I would love to know if there is someone I could bill for the time I lost because of my emotional state, that actually was, the, I think, the emotional state that happened after that was very similar to what happens with probably anyone who has been through assault. 
And I even wonder if, in fact, and am I running way past the time here? I am sorry. We would like to ask unanimous consent to allow her to continue with this testimony for another two minutes. Without objection, please. Okay, thank you. So what happens is that I went through two weeks of very d disrupted time over the, the response to that. All right. Moving forward again very quickly to uh, February the 20th, not very long ago, um, I suddenly find myself having gone back to the doctor and finding myself at the airport again and thinking something had changed at the airport, find myself with a full body scan, which I haven't worried about. I have heard many people worry about it. Um, but what happened after that was I faced the woman. And my husband and I had talked about it. I had vowed that I was not ever going to go through that again. I said no. What I found out after having said no and having really felt better after that, because I actually was starting to protect myself, and I to this moment feel very proud of having done that, I suddenly put myself right in with all of the huge numbers of people who have been harmed. And I have received well over 1,000 letters, um, emails, Facebook is alive with this. It is amazing how many people have stopped me every single day, many times a day, with their stories of how they have been harmed. And I sent in my, uh, my uh, statement that I uh, emailed you folks um, many of the comments that were made. Um, but I have also witnessed exactly how Alaska uh, does deal with this. And the minute that I got back to Alaska, the thing that was amazing to me was that my legislature had passed a sense of the House on how I had done the right thing, that it was the right thing for me to have done. And they have put out a, um, a resolution that has to, is to come to you. And it goes through all of the different things that and, and the most important is how important air travel is to us. But how our Alaskans have been harmed. We are four times, we travel four times what the, the rest of the United States does. All the other m members of, the, um, of our citizens that travel, and I think I am supposed to be ending here. Um, I hope you will read the rest of my comments and, and any other questions, please ask. Thank you, and thank you for that testimony. We will put the balance of your testimony into to the record. Uh, I would also like to ask unanimous consent that the resolution from the State of Alaska be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, we will now move to questioning. I would like to recognize myself for five minutes, and then each member will be able to ask five minutes. Uh, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of the United States of America is our commitment to the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable search and seizure. From your personal viewpoint, you are also a State lawmaker, how do we find that balance and what was your personal experience? In, there are many that argue, well, if you choose to go on an airplane, then you choose to give up those rights. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us your perspective? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and, Mr. Chair, it is absolutely true for Alaskans that we don't choose. We don't have a choice. Uh, I did make my way back to Alaska after that uh, event at the airport on the 20th of February, but uh, it took four days. It, it took four days, and I was really lucky because I was able to find uh, in, in Canada someone to fly me to Prince Rupert. And so then I was able to take the Marine Highway and get to Alaska that way. But for people in remote parts of our state, what happens is that they oftentimes, their first time away from those remote places, because of operations, have to fly out of the state. And they are and they're patient at that time. I hope that they get consideration at that time when they go out. We don't have the level of screening because it is metallics that in the uh, metal detector uh, that we get screened with so far. 
um, that's, that's what would have them felt up. But after they come back, after they have the operation, when they leave the, opera the, the operating scene and the, the hospital, what happens is they are picked up by maybe a taxi, they are taken to an airport, and they become not a patient anymore, they are just a standard citizen. That is part of the, what I have heard from many of the caregivers in remote Alaska are, are talking about, is that they then, not only is it the, the, uh, the stretcher or the, the uh, wheelchair or whatever they are uh, brought to the hospital, that has to be searched. It is taken apart. Then they are very va invasively examined. This is absolutely, is, mine was not anything compared to what the, it would be for these people. And this is Alaska, this is the experience that they go through under the current system. And that is what the legislature is hoping we do, is revert to the less invasive. Um, now, now, certainly we have to secure airplanes. I mean, there is a terrorist threat. Absolutely. Um, uh, but you would never pass uh, somebody who has um, some sort of uh, prosthetic device or some other implant or something like that, in theory, should not actually pass or, or get through those whole body imaging machines and others. So what do you, do you have a suggestion on what we do as an alternative? The fact is that until February 20th, I really had not thought very much about this. I just kind of, well, actually, it was, it was actually in October that I really started thinking about this, and not October, pardon me, November. But um, I have had many, many letters from many, many different people who have traveled all over the world, been through all kinds of different screening devices. As I understand, there's two that I've had close friends uh, go through in, the, in this last year, and both in Holland and Israel. Uh, they have extraordinarily successful screening devices that are very non-invasive, very. From your personal experience, uh, going back to the Fourth Amendment, unreasonable search and seizure, these pat-downs are invasive, to say the least. Um, and somebody who doesn't have another option, do you, there are many of us that believe that this would be deemed a sexual assault Absolutely. on a person. Absolutely. Your personal perspective, and we have just 30 seconds here, based on what you have experienced in these pat-downs, how would you relate that to the Fourth Amendment and uh, the definition of an assault? I think it is absolutely an assault, and, and it is the worst kind of assault in that it is essentially very similar to uh, PTSD and the kinds of reactions that people get with that. What I haven't seen are studies. What I'm not seeing is the oversight that really gives us a chance to really look at this and find out what's happening to our Americans. I'm worried about my state, but I'm also worried about my fellow Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We will now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Chair. Thank you, five Representative. Minutes. Thank you for coming here and testifying today. Uh, particularly the difficulty it uh, caused you, and I know it wasn't a pleasant experience for you, and it can't be easy for you to testify. So we appreciate you coming all this way and, and talking with us today. I think you hit it on the head. Everybody would like a less um, invasive but equally effective process on that, and that is what I think the proper oversight is going to try to, to get us on that, on that, on that path. There's, in my opening uh, statement, I made reference to the fact that there is apparently a technology out there now that is being tested that would not give a a full image, a full body image, but rather would put something like a Gumby, if you remember what the Gumby background was, or a stick figure, something that basis, and then identify only an anomaly um, that came out, say, on your leg, if you had something strapped to your leg or whatever, and then that would be the only area that was uh, patted down or uh, investigated. Do you have a feeling about the, that aspect of it? Do you think that that still uh, is a problem? The, the problem appears to have been um, the, the not having done adequate uh, study for there not to have uh, been um, really the time taken to make sure that we are doing no harm. And that is the most critical role any um, lawmaker has, is to do no harm. And not taking the time is something I think we have to fix. That is 
That is doing our job. Uh, I understand you, you know, and I understand that Congress has to take some responsibility for that. After the um, so-called underwear bomber, the shoe bomber, whatever, they were faced with the confrontation doing nothing, uh, which didn't seem to, in, I guess, their collective um, uh, wisdom to, to be the way to go because the situation was there. So they did what they thought was best at the time and, and were being told that that was effective. But my real question on this particular one was if there was not an image of your individual being up there, but as some sort of a Gumby or a stick figure or whatever, and if there was an anomaly that was detected in some isolated location on your body and that area were the only area inspected, what is your reaction to that sort of an examination or process? I think you have to look at the whole process, because one triggers the other. It is created, and the, the thing that is the most troubling to me is as I look at all of the people on the airplane as I am getting on, I understand they are all, they're all guilty before they are proven innocent and that we have got to get away from that. We have got to really start respecting our people. So I guess, am I, are you saying that basically let everybody on unless they, they have some telltale sign? Absolutely not. Absolutely, we have, to, we have to do the kind of screening that gets us the best results. But it doesn't have to be the, the, one, the, it, the technology that is there now is not I know I get that. And I guess I was yeah, trying to get your opinion on an, on a, an alternative one, but I, you, you apparently don't want to give your opinion on that. Not without a lot of facts, not without proof that it is good, not without proof no. that we have done our job. I think that goes without saying, but okay, I will yield back. Mm -hmm. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you very much. And I, I can understand what you have been through. Both my daughter and I have had the misfortune of triggering these machines with an anomaly. And the, the search we both endured was very invasive. And uh, you have the greatest sympathy uh, from me. Let me ask you, what, one of the things that you have not addressed, or if you did, I, I was reading through your testimony and didn't hear it. Um, my, but my question is, would you be willing to submit to some form of uh, background check, surrendering your fingerprints or retinal data in order to get into a trusted traveler program where you are able to undergo a less strenuous level of security? Would you consider that to be a reasonable alternative? I would consider that to be reasonable. Um, and and that, that kind of alternative is one. There are others also that, that are uh, doing psych using psychological um, procedures that actually help uh, create a profile, not, not a racial and not a, um, a cultural profile, but one that actually will a, a scan that, that identifies people who are obviously up to no good. And there are ways of coming up with that. That has been found in other places. But it is a matter of actually looking elsewhere and, and seeing if there aren't, aren't other options. There usually are. It is my understanding we, the, uh, the TSA profiles boxes, but they won't profile passengers. You know, they will profile a box based on its shape, its country of origins, and, and uh, when, from you know, where it was shipped from. Uh, we, we take no effort at all to determine if you are flying in from you know, middle America or a foreign country that is uh, hostile to us, your level of screening is the same. And to me, that defies logic. But that is not a question, that is a speech. So I will yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back. We will now recognize the gentleman from, gentlewoman from Texas for five minutes. I thank the chairman of the subcommittee and the ranking member of the subcommittee, especially for their courtesies. And I thank the uh, chairman of the full committee uh, and as well uh, the uh, ranking member of the full committee for their courtesies. Um, it is a pleasure to see you this morning. I am um, uh, not on this committee, but I am the ranking member and former chair of the Transportation Security uh, Committee with oversight over TSA uh, and uh, on the Homeland Security Committee. I will tell you that um, many of my waking hours address the question of professionalism and more training for the transportation security officers. And I think you would venture to say, uh, as someone who needs flying as a mode of transportation, uh, that in most or many instances, uh, our TSO officers uh, work within the realm that they have uh, and use the skills in an appropriate manner. But you are right. 
uh, we have to look at those issues uh, that, as our colleagues have indicated, uh, may impact the Fourth Amendment, uh, may impact the dignity of all travelers. I do want to put on the record uh, that I am going to join with uh, the ranking member of our committee, Homeland Security, Mr. Thompson, and we will be writing a letter uh, to ask for alternative protocols for individuals uh, in your situation and also individuals who are traveling with medical devices and uh, traveling uh, with other uh, medical equipment, uh, traveling with a caretaker, uh, and we expect to hear from them very soon, and we will be working with this uh, committee. I, I do want to pose, uh, so I, I look forward to utilizing your testimony, your written testimony. Uh, and I listened to my friend and colleague from Texas about uh, the trusted traveler, and there are a lot of options uh, that we could look at. My question to you would be uh, to establish the fact that uh, there are threats to the United States. You still believe that that is the case. Is that true, Representative? I, you have to be uh, oral on the record so they can okay. record it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, I certainly do agree with you. And it is absolutely essential, living where we do on the northwest um, perimeter of, of our country, um, we are right there. We are mm -hmm. at the place where we really need to be constantly alert. And that is exactly why I have the feelings I do is that I need to keep my population safe and strong so that they can be watchful, too. We are the ones who are going to see trouble coming from another direction. Well, you have the eyes and ears. So yep. we, we lay that groundwork, and we know that the uh, transportation security officers play a valuable role in that. And you, too, watched uh, that fateful Christmas Day uh, when we saw a unique effort of trying to blow up a plane and harm the United States, the Christmas Day bomber. That generated this enhanced uh, review, if you will. Uh, so um, would you uh, offer to me any other thoughts you have about uh, just uh, briefly on what enhanced security measures you think we should take? Uh, thank you very much, through the Chair. Um, and uh, the list of things that you are you're asking for, uh, some kind of either exemption or some kind of uh, way that people can avoid the more intense kinds of screening, um, any kind of prosthesis at all um, is a problem. Any kind of, not just medical, but when people have pacemakers. And the things that people are going through is just amazingly uh, severe. And I agree with you that the TSA employees that I have seen are doing a really good job of, of improving uh, their attitude, their treatment of the public seems to be improving. Uh, and so it is the procedures itself. I have just problem. a few more minutes, if I might just say. Have you gone through an AIT machine? I may have the the. Have you gone through those uh, machines? That is the full body. Yes. Um, and through the chair, pardon me. Uh, yes, I did tw twice actually. And that's when they found something in one. So my point is, let me just conclude by saying, on that point, you willingly went through the AIT. We thank you for that, and we need to look at protocols that then respond. Uh, to how we address individuals with medical concerns, devices, prosthetics, and my commitment to you is that we look forward to addressing that question. With that, Mr. Chairman, um, I yield back. Thank you for your courtesy. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you could join us. The gentlewoman yields back. I will now recognize the, the ranking member uh, from uh, Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, Representative, I want to thank you for being here today. Sometimes when we are addressing issues that are very personal, it is very, very difficult. Because what it says is that we are opening up ourselves to the public. Folk will be watching you on C-SPAN tonight. Some of them are watching you right now. And so you not only become exposed to, you know, a few folks, but you basically become exposed to the whole country. 
And for that, I thank you, because you said some things that really touched me. And <clears throat> there are two elements that, that kind of hit me. One, you talked about the training and whether this person was properly trained, and you talked about courtesy. And then you also talked about the invasiveness and the medical situation in some kind of way. And then you also talked about how there are some things that people just should not have to go through. And I guess, you know, I'm just trying to make sure that we strike this balance. Now, one thing is for sure, we certainly can try to make sure that the TSA administrator brings some type of sensitivity training, if they don't already, to their folks. They need to know what people go through. I have relatives that have experienced medical situations where they have certain devices that, you know, might send off any machine or whatever. But so that, I, I can understand that. But they need to be sensitive to that, too. And there's nothing that is worse than somebody not being courteous to another human being. President Obama said something that I wish I had invented myself. He said, sometimes we have in our country an empathy deficit an empathy deficit. And so we, we've got a, what I'm, what I'm hoping is that your testimony will allow us to strike the balance that I know you want, because you, you fully understand <clears throat> safety, but you also understand privacy. You understand making sure that a plane doesn't come down out of the sky but you also making sure you you also know that there are millions upon millions upon millions of people who travel who never even have an idea even think about trying to bring any kind of harm so it's a it's a tough one and so again i want to thank you because i believe that your testimony will help us try to get to that balance that we need and i've often said this so often when we go through something it provides us with a passport because we have experienced it to, to, to help other people and to help address their problems because we become the greatest witnesses. Somebody just saying it, talking about it is one thing, but when you've been through it, that's a whole nother thing. And so I just, I don't really have any questions. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for, after going through all that you've been through and being exposed all the ways that you've been exposed, and now to, to even go through another exposure for the sake of balance, for the sake of safety, for the sake of the rights of all of our citizens, on behalf of our Congress and of our nation, I take this moment to simply say thank you. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Representative, we are concluding this first panel. Do you have any concluding comment that you would like to make briefly? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, Mr. Chair, actually, the, the comment that uh, all of this has brought to me uh, over the last several weeks that I have been really uh, the focus of, of a huge number of people coming and telling me things they haven't told other people is that the sense I have gotten is there is many people who have been losing the, the trust of their government through this kind of thing, and that doing this right, that is one of the things that we really do, is we win back the hearts of our, our people. And I believe in government. I think government is the answer in its own way. And it needs to keep that, that idea um, in, in, a, in a balance. We need both public and private. But government can answer a lot of, of problems that we have. But without trust, we are not going to keep the kind of democracy we have. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your time, your bravery for being here and sharing your, a very personal story.
You represent the story of a lot of Americans. We, we thank you for the time and effort that you have taken to be here. It is a long trek to be here, uh, but I assure you that it is very worthwhile. We thank you. May God bless you. And uh, For now, we'll, we are going to uh, go into recess uh, here for about five minutes or so while we prepare for the second panel. Thank you.